Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together on the 18th of the fourth month, and it is the 2nd of July on the Gregorian calendar. Uh, we're still currently reading through the recognitions of Clement together, and right now we're getting ready to go through Clement's dissertation or teaching on the paganism of the Greeks. He's saying this for the benefit of Kepha, but he's also speaking of the disgusting things that they do so that those that worship them can acknowledge that they're not profitable and turn from it. And at the end of this, while it is unpleasant, they ask why, why people would even worship these things. And it, it's explained um, why the demons do that. So to get right into it, this is chapter 20 of book nine, The Doings of Jupiter. Or it could be book 10, I'm sorry. But it says, but enough of the old wives' fables and genealogy of the nations. See, because that's what those false mighty ones were. They were the patriarchs of the nations that were venerated later on. And it makes more sense when you think about it because they lived hundreds of years, not as long as the ones before them, but longer than their children did, right? says, for it were endless if I should set forth all the generations of those whom they call Elohim and their immoral doings, but by way of example, omitting the rest, I will detail the immoral deeds of him only whom they hold to be the greatest and the chief, whom they call Jupiter. Now, that's what I'd forgotten. I wanted to look up in the, the telegram before we got started a link I had shared with Brother Paul. I had found in the Clementine homilies, there was a section where Kepha was preaching or and talking about the messengers that came down. And he distinctly said that the stories or the base things that the watchers did were what the stories that the Greeks used for their mythologies. And that's what was being alluded to right here. All the things that you see here are what you can see that the watchers were capable of doing, changing their shape and mating with things that unnaturally and causing what you'd say the demi false mighty ones, <clears throat> right? But to continue. It says, for they say that he possesses heaven, or Shemaim, as being superior to the rest. And he, as soon as he grew up, married his own sister, whom they call Juno, in which truly he at once becomes like a beast. <laughs> Juno bears Vulcan, but as they relate, Jupiter was not his father. However, by Jupiter himself, she became mother of Medai, or Medea. And Jupiter, having received a response that one who should be born of her should be more powerful than himself and should expel him from his kingdom, took her and devoured her. Again, Jupiter produced Minerva from his brain and Bacchus from his thigh. Now, this, her, her name is something to do with a thought, right? That's why he says he produced her from his mind. And then Bacchus, it's not anything to do with a thigh, but it has to do with weeping. The Brachinellis, or it's, it's the weeping for Tammuz, but the Greek version. It says, after this, when he had fallen in love with Thetis, they say that Prometheus informed him that if he lay with her, he who should be born of her should be more powerful than his father. And for fear of this, he gave her in marriage to one Peleus. Subsequently, he had intercourse with Fesperon, or Persephone, Persephone, sorry who was his own daughter by Ceres or Cres? I'm sorry if I'm not saying these right. I'm not very keen on Greek mythology. 
Persephone. <clears throat> Persephone, thank you. Right. And by her, he begat Dionysus. Um, this is also Hebrew. I can't remember the etymology of what it means at the moment, but it is rather interesting. I'll look it up for you later. It's found in Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons. Who was torn in pieces by the Titans. <clears throat> but calling to mind, it is supposed that his own father Saturn might beget another son who might be more powerful than himself and might expel him from the kingdom. He went to war with his father, along with his brothers, the Titans, and having beaten them, he at last threw his father into prison and cut off his genitals and threw them into the sea. But the blood that flowed from the wound being mixed with the waves and turned into foam by the constant churning produced her whom they call Aphrodite, and whom with us they call Venus. From his intercourse with her, who was thus his own sister, they say that this same Jupiter begot Cyprus, who they say was the mother of Cupid. And Cupid is another form of Tammuz. Thus much of his incests, I will now speak of his adulteries. He defiled Europa. And Europa was the sister of what, Phoenix, Cadmus, and um, Cadmus who gave the alphabet to the Greek seen peoples, if you remember, and one other, and she was taken into Europe by a bull, and they went to go find her, but could not, and the whole land of Europe was named after Europa there because of it. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but that's the, the history behind the name there. So he defiled Europa, the wife of Oceanus, of whom was born Dodonon, or Dodonius, Helen, the wife of Pation, of whom Musaeus, Erimon, or Erinomi, the wife of Esopus, of whom Ogigaius, Hermone, or Har yeah, the wife of Oceanus, of whom the Graces, Thalii, yeah, I'm not going to say these right, I'm sorry. Europh Europrosyne, Agalia, <laughs> Themis, his own sister, of whom the hours, and the hours are the false mighty ones, but where they get the name for that, right, that keeps time. And the reason for this is the Greeks, they had a fault, they had a false mighty one, or they attributed to deity every. Ruach or spirit that had a function or anything that might have a function in creation, they attributed to a mighty one instead of having the proper order. Euromonia, Dice, Irene, Theomisto, or Themisto, sorry, the daughter of Inechus, of whom Arches, Idea, the daughter of Minos, of whom Astrion, Phenosia, the daughter of Alphion, of whom Yod Yodimon, sorry, Yodmion, Io, the daughter of Incius, of whom Epaphus, Hippodromia, and Isonia, sorry, daughters of Danius, of whom Hippodromia was the wife of Olin. Olenius, and Iseno, and Ochromenus, or Charis, Carmi, the daughter of Phoenix, of whom was born Burrito Martis, who was the attendant of Diana, Callisto, and Diana is another name for Athena. Athena was the Greek version of Athen, which was the Kazdim version of Adon, the 
Dalit and the Tao being interchangeable with them, or the sound for it. So Athena is my lady, if you will. Right. There's so many songs and science fiction things that have these names and promote it, carried all the way back from these stories of the Greeks, which really came from the demons who lived through the times of the watchers and carried all that stuff over to them. And then it was picked up hardcore by the Jesuits in the 1500s with the Jesuit theater. They they did plays and reenacted the the inappropriate things of the Greek. That's what the tragedies were. <clears throat> or that's what the theaters were during that time. And they carried on even into modern times. They still do it with Marvel action uh, movies and whatnot. But it says, Castillo, the daughter of Lyconan, of whom Orcus, Libby, the daughter of Munantita, or Munatias, of whom Belus, now, I don't know where he gets all these things. I can't attest for every one of them. But some of these names I'm familiar with. Okay, Belus is where we get Bel from, right? And Belus was another name for Ham. He was one of the first magicians, right? It said one of the first practitioners of witchcraft or magic. Lactona, of whom Apollo and Diana. Leandia, the daughter of Enre Medon, of whom Horon, Lysithia, the daughter of Evenus, of whom Helenus, Hippodamia, the daughter of Bellerophon, of whom Sarpedon, Megaslite, or Megalite, Megaclite, sorry, the daughter of Marcarius, of whom Thebe and Locris. Niobe, the daughter of Phronius, of whom Argos and Pelascus. Olympias, the daughter of Neto Neptolomus, of whom Alexander. Phara, the daughter of Prometheus, of whom Helmethesis. <clears throat> Protogenia and Pandora, the daughters of Delusion, of whom he begat. Atathelius and Doris and Melera and Pandorus, Thyacrusia, the daughter of Proteus, of whom was born Nymphus, Salamis, the daughter of Osipus, Osipus rather, of whom Sarakon, Taigeti, Electra, Maya, Plutide, daughters of Atlas, of whom respectively he begot Lysidemona, Dandarnus, or Dandinus, Mercury, and Tantalus. And this isn't necessarily all true, because Lacedaemonians were Hebrews. Dan, Dardan was, Darda was a son of Zerah. So th these are just the stories that they carry down. Right. And they have all these names attributed to all these false mighty ones to claim that they came, they were all deified men. But it says Mercury and Tantalus, Phaethea, and the daughter of Baronius, of whom he begot Achaeus, Chonia, the daughter of Armenius, or Amr Amernus, sorry, of whom he begot Lacone. Chalcia, a nymph of whom was born Olympus. Charadia, a nymph of whom was born Alcanus, sorry, of whom Alcanus. Cholerus, of, or who was the wife of Ampicus, of whom Mopsus was born. Contina, the daughter of Lispus, of whom Polymedes, Hippodama, or Hepidamia, the daughter of Anistus, Trisongenia, the daughter of Paneus, of whom was born Theseus. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Vile transformation of Jupiter. And 
the list that we just went through was just covering the adulteries of the one main mighty one that they worship. Now it's going into the things that he did with bestiality, if you will. It says, there are also innumerable adulteries of his, which no offspring was the result, which it would be tedious to enumerate. But amongst those whom we have mentioned, he violated some being transformed like a magician. In short, he seduced Antiope, or Antiope, Antiope the daughter of Nicetus, Nicetus, sorry, when turned into a satyr. And of her were born Amphion and Zethus. Almini was changed into her, her husband. Amph I'm sorry, Al yeah, Almini, when changed into her husband, Amphitryon, and of her was born Hercules. And Gina, the daughter of Asopus, when changed into an eagle, of whom Aeacus was born, so also he defiled Ganymede, the son of Dardanus, being changed into an eagle. Manthea, the daughter of Phocus, when changed into a bear, of whom was born Arctos. Dany, the daughter of Acrisius, being changed into gold, of whom Perseus. Europa, the daughter of Phoenix, changed into a bull, of whom were born Minos. Radamethus and Sarpedon, Euromedusa, or Euromedusa, the daughter of Archelaus, being changed into an ant, of whom Myrmidon, Thylia, the nymph, being changed into a vulture, of whom were born the Palisci in Sicily. And if you think about it, after the time of the flood, where Nimrod and others were, he was became like a mighty hunter before Yahuwah. It mentions explicitly earlier in the book here that he learned magic or witchcraft from his fathers. And to be able to change shapes and to do other things was not an uncommon thing. It was what the watchers would do regularly. It's not something that we see as much anymore openly, but it is quite prevalent even today. I'll give you one example. They have the a Chinese form of, or an Asian form of magic mask changing, where they put their hands before their face or a little, uh, they'll wave a little towel or whatever they have in their hand and different masks will pop up on their face. They, they call it, uh, what they call it their type of magic. They make it seem like it's a parlor trick, but it's real witchcraft. They do that kind of stuff too. David Copperfield was involved in real witchcraft with demons. There's actually a Catholic video that's quite, quite extensive in proving those things, but it's just to divert attention from the witchcraft that's throughout Catholicism. So the one is an overt, an open one, because it's trying to divert from the one that is hidden. However, John Todd makes it very clear the only difference between the exorcism spell in witchcraft and in Catholicism is about six words. But they have the same source. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So getting back on track here, it says, Emandra, the daughter of Genius, at Rhodes being changed into a shower, Cassiopeia, or Cassiopeia, being changed into her husband Phoenix, and of her was born Antinos. Leda, the daughter of Theteus, being changed into a swan, of whom was born Helen, and again the same being changed into a star, and of her was born Castor and Pollux. Lamia being changed into a lapwing, Men Memnocene, I'm not saying that right, sorry, being changed into a shepherd, of whom were born the nine muses, 
Nemesis being changed into a goose, the Cadmian Semli being changed into fire, and of her was born Dionysius. By his own daughter, Cres, he begat Persephone, Persephone, right? Persephone, there you go. Whom also herself he defiled, being changed into a dragon. And very, very well, why anyone want to know why an Elohim, right? He also committed adultery with Europa, the wife of his own uncle, Oceanus, and with her sister, Euronomi, and punished their father. And he committed adultery with Plute, the daughter of his own son, Atlas, and condemned Tantalus, whom she bore to him. Of Larissi, the daughter of Orchromenius, he begat Titian, whom also he consigned to punishment. He carried off Dia, the wife of his own son, Eoxion, and subjected him to perpetual punishment. And I want you to pay attention. The uh, You serve them, you're going to become like them. And the same thing happened to the sovereigns that turned away from Yahuwah. When they act in ways that are promoted by demons, then they have the same outcomes as those demons did in life, where they do evil to their own children, they're conspired against by those who serve them, there's chaos and destruction and evil because that's what they do and that's what they reap, right? You can see a perfect example of that in the fifth book of the Maccabees or in Josephus during the time of Herod's reign. How he chose to be in his life had a direct consequence on what happened with him and his children. And he literally lost all of his children within the, the next generation because what he chose to do in his life. This is, and subjected him to perpetual punishment. And almost all the sons who spring from his adulteries he put to violent deaths. And indeed, the sepulchres of almost all of them are well known. Yea, the sepulcher of this parasite himself who destroyed his uncles and defiled their wives, who committed whoredom with the, his sisters, this magician of many transformations is shown among the Cretans, which if you remember, Shaul had nothing kind to say about the Cretans. And that word is actually throughout the original covenant writings too. The word for Cretan, it's an interesting thing to look into. But, who, although they know and acknowledge his horrid and incestuous deeds, and tell them to all, yet are not ashamed to confess him to be a mighty one or an Elohim. Whence it seems to me to be wonderful, yea, exceedingly wonderful, how he who exceeds all men in immorality and crimes has received that devoted and good name, that is above every name, being called the father of Elohim and men. Unless he who rejoices in the evils of men has persuaded evil, miserable spirits to confer honor above all others upon him whom he saw to excel all others in crimes, in order that he might allure all to the imitation of his evil deeds. But also the sepulchres of his sons, who are regarded amongst these as Elohim, are openly pointed out, one in one place and another in another. That of Mercury at Hermiopolis, that of Cyperon Venus at Cyprus, that of Mars in Thrice, that of Bacchus in Thebes, where he is said to have been torn in pieces, that of Hercules at Tyre, you remember where Tyre is? Tyre is right next to Sidon. That's the Phoenician city. That's where Hercules, if you remember Samson, was right next to them. And that was where Herodotus mentioned was the first temple that was built to him. 
It says, where he was burnt with fire, that of Asclepius, and I probably didn't say that exactly right, but he's also mentioned, and re, he's one of the false mighty ones that's um, rebuked by our creator in the book of Revelation, amongst the other ones that are condemned when he's punishing Rome. But in Epidorius, and all these are spoken of not only as men who have died, but as immoral men who have been punished for their crimes, and yet they are adored as Elohim by foolish men. But if they choose to argue and affirm that these are rather the places of their birth than of their burial and death, or death rather, the former and ancient doings will be convicted from those at hand and still recent, since we have shown that they worship those whom they themselves confess to have been men and to have died, or rather to have been punished, as the Syrians worship Andonis and the Mitzrayim worship Osiris, the Trojans Hector, Achilles is worshipped at Lusicon Leoconesius or Leoconesus, Petroclus at Pontus, Alexander the Macedonian at Rhodes, and many others are worshipped, one in one place and another in another, whom they do not doubt to have been dead men. Whence it follows that their predecessors also falling into a like error, conferred divine honor upon dead men who may have had some power or some skill and especially if they had stupefied stolid men by magical fantasies and the same thing that Mitzrayim did if you remember it talks about how he using magic called down lightning from the stars over and over to wow foolish men and upset the demon to the point where he was struck by it and killed. Hence there has now been added that the poets also adorn the falsehoods of error by elegance of words, and by sweetness of speech persuade that mortals have been made immortal. Yea, more, they say that men are changed into stars and trees and animals, and flowers, and birds, and fountains, and rivers, and but that it might seem to be a waste of words, I could even enumerate almost all the stars, and trees, and fountains, and rivers, which they assert to have been made of men. Yet, by way of example, I will mention at least one of each class. They say that Andromeda, the daughter of Cephas, was turned into a star. Daphne, the daughter of the river Lado, into a tree. Hyacinthus, beloved of Apollo, or Apollyon, if you will, into a flower. Callisto, into the constellation that they call Arctos, Prongni, and Philomela with Tereus into birds, that Thes and in Cilicia was dissolved into a fountain, and Perimus at the same place into a river. And they assert that almost all the stars, trees, fountains, and rivers, flowers, animals, and birds were at one time men, or people, if you will. If you look into what they say the meaning of human is, it in legal definition, and it's hidden all over in their legalese, but it's the reprobate of scripture or the natural man who's unable to see to receive the things of the Ruach of Elohim. So it's not something that you should want to call yourself. He says, but Kepha, when he heard this said, according to them, then before men were changed into stars and the other things that you mentioned, 
The Shemaim was without stars and the earth without trees and animals. And there were neither fountains nor rivers nor birds. And without these, how did those men themselves live? Who afterwards were changed into them? Since it is evident that without these things, men could not live upon the earth. Then I answered, but they are not even able to observe the worship of their own Elohim consistently. For every one of those whom they worship has something dedicated to himself from which the worshipers ought to abstain. As they say, the olive is dedicated to Minerva, the she-goat to Jupiter, seeds to Creus, wine to Bacchus, water to Osiris, the ram to Haman, the stag to Diana, the fish and the dove to the demon of the Syrians, fire to Vulcan, and to each one, as I have said, is there something specifically set apart from which the worshippers are bound to abstain for the honor of those to whom they are set apart? But where the one abstaining from one thing and another from another, by doing honor to one of the Elohim, they incur the anger of all the rest. And therefore, if they would conciliate them all, they must abstain from all things for the honor of all, so that being self-condemned by a righteous sentence before the day of judgment, they should perish by a most wretched death through starvation. But let us return to our purpose. What reason is there, yea, rather, what madness possesses the minds of men, that they worship and adore as a mighty one, a man whom they not only know to be disobedient, immoral, profane, I mean Jupiter, incestuous, a parricide, an adulterer, but even proclaim him publicly as such in their songs and in theaters. Or, if by means of these deeds he has deserved to be a mighty one, and then also, when they hear of any murderers, adulterers, parricides, incestuous persons, they ought to worship them as a mighty one, or also as mighty ones. But I cannot comprehend why they venerate in him what they extricate in others. Kepha answered, Since you say that you cannot comprehend it, learn of me why they venerate immorality in him. In the first place, it is that when they themselves do like deeds, they may know that they will be acceptable to him. Inasmuch as they have but imitated him in his immorality. In the second place, because the ancients have left these things skillfully composed in their writings and elegantly engrafted in their verses. And now, by the aid of youthful education, you train up a child in the way he should go, and it, it's a predominant, it's a fact of history that the Jesuits took over and dominated the field of education. Um, even to today, as some of us know. But and now, by the aid of youthful education, since the knowledge of these things ad adheres to their tender and simple minds, it cannot without difficulty be torn from them and cast away. When Kepha had said this, Nasita answered, Do not suppose, my master Kepha, but that the learned men of the nations have certain plausible arguments by which they support those things that seem to be blameworthy and dishonorable. And this I state, not as wishing to confirm their error, far, for far be it from me that such a thing should ever come into my thought. But yet I know that there are amongst the more intelligent of them certain defenses by which they are accustomed to support and color over those things that seem to be absurd. 
And if it please you that I should state some of them, for I am to some extent acquainted with them, I will do as you order me. And when Kepha had given him leave, Nesita proceeded as follows. And this is the cosmogony of Orpheus. Orpheus was one of the people who came up with their idea of how things are or exist in the world. The cosmogony as opposed to cosmology. Okay. But it says all the liter all the literature among the Greeks that is written on the subject of the origin of antiquity is based upon many authorities, but especially two, Orpheus and Hisod. Now their writings are divided into two parts in respect of their meaning, that is the literal and the allegorical. And the vulgar crowd has flocked to the literal but all the eloquence of the the philosopher the philosophers and learned men is expended in admiration of the allegorical and if you're familiar vulgar means common so the common crowd flocks to the literal meaning of the things the base adultery the the, the nitty-gritty for the the wicked things it brings up into your mind right but the more learned men use the allegorical things to explain away this stuff. And he's going to explain it right now. He says, it is Orpheus then who says that at first there was chaos, ageless, unbounded, unproduced, and that from it all things were made. He says that this chaos was neither darkness nor light, neither moist nor dry, neither hot nor cold, but that it was all things mixed together and was always one unformed mass. Yet that at length, as it were after the manner of a huge egg, it brought forth and produced from itself a certain double form, which had been wrought through immense periods of time and which they call masculo-feminine, a form concrete from the contrary at a mixture of such diversity and that this is the principle of all things which came of pure matter and which coming forth effected a separation of the four elements and made shamayim of the two elements that are first fire and air and earth of the of the others earth and water and of these, he says that all things now are bound, or sorry, are born and produced by a mutual participation of them. So much for Orpheus. Hisod's cosmogony. But to this, Hisod adds that after chaos, the Shemaim, or heaven, and the earth were made immediately. From which he says, that those 11 were produced, and sometimes also he speaks of them as 12, of whom he makes six males and, and five females. And these are the names that he gives to the males, Oceanus, Coas, Cyrus, or yeah, Cyrus, Hyperion, Ipetus, I'm not, and Kronos, who is also called Saturn. Also, the names of the females are Thea, Rhea, Themis, Mesmenosini, Mes I'm not saying that right, I'm sorry, and Tethys. And these names, they thus interpret allegorically. They say that the number is 11 or 12, that the first is nature itself, which also they would have to be called Rhea from flowing. And they say that the other ten are her, her acid, her accidents, her accidents, right? Accidents, what happens afterwards or as a cause of, which also they call qualities. Yet they add a twelfth, namely Kronos, who with us is called Saturn, and him they take to be time. 
Therefore, they assert that Saturn and Rhea are time and matter. And these, when they are mixed with moisture and dryness, heat and cold, produce all things. She, therefore, Rhea or nature, it is said, produced, as it were, a certain bubble that had been collecting for a long time. And it being gradually collected from the spirit that was in the waters, swelled, and being for some time driven over the surface of matter, from which it had come forth as from a womb, and being hardened by the rigor of cold, and always increasing by additions of ice, at length was broken off and sunk into the deep, and drawn by its own weight, went down to the infernal regions. And because it became invisible, it was called Hades, and is also named Orcus or Pluto. And since it was sunk from the top to the bottom, it gave place to the moist element to flow together. And the grosser part, which is the earth, was laid bare by the retirement of the waters. They say, therefore, that this freedom of the waters, which was formerly restrained by the presence of the bubble, was called Neptune, after the bubble obtained the lowest place. After this, when the cold element had been sucked down to the lower regions by the concentration of the icy bubble, and the dry and the moist element had been separated, there being now no hindrance, the warm element rushed by its force and lightness to the upper regions of the air, being borne up by wind and storm. This storm, therefore, which in Greek is called katigio, they call agis, that is, a she-goat. And the fire that ascended to the upper regions they called Jupiter. So they say that he ascended to Olympus riding on a she-goat. Now this Jupiter the Greeks would have to be called from his living or giving life. But our people from his giving succor or succor, right? Comfort. They say, therefore, that this is the living substance which placed in the upper regions and drawing all things to itself by the influence of heat, as by the conv convolution of the brain, and arranging them by the moderation of a certain tempering. Now, I want to pause for a minute. This is unrelated to the topic at hand, but it's rather interesting. Right here, it says, and drawing all things to itself by the influence of heat as by the convolution of the brain. Right there, it's only recently, I don't know if you remember, but the lady that does the Eagle's Wings Ministries and talks about how scripture is literally how the body functions for your health and well-being. Disease comes from wrong thinking and things of that nature. She, explored, she mentioned that they did science they know as a fact that when you have a thought come to mind, it can be something that you yourself think upon or that it is an influence from outside. But what you choose to dwell on in your free thought process, like what you freely choose to think on yourself, that's what's stored as a memory in the neurons that are, that are formed as you think about it. It's building nerves in your brain that are literally storing that as memories. And the more you, you think on it, the stronger those memories will be, the more roots you'll have in those neurons, the more you do it. And um, the point is, if you have a, a, a thought like anger or lust or anything come to mind, and then you choose not to think about it, you actively refuse or you put your mind on something else, that thought literally turns into hot air in your mind literally and she she mentions that in a few times in her videos but they have discovered that in in the medical field i want to say almost over a decade ago or about a decade ago but back on point here 
It says, I'm going to start over with right here. They say, therefore, that this is the living substance which placed in the upper regions and drawing all things to itself by the influence of heat as by the convolution of the brain and arranging them by the moderation of a certain tempering is said from his head to have produced hokma or wisdom whom they call minerva who was called athena by the greeks on account of her immortality who because the father of all created all things by his wisdom is also said to have been produced from his head and from the principal place of all and is represented as having formed and adorned the whole world by the regulated added mixture of the elements. Therefore, the forms that were impressed upon matter, that the world might be made, because they are constrained by the force of heat, are said to be held together by the energy of Jupiter. And since there are enough of these, and they do not need anything new to be added to them. But each thing is repaired by the produce of its own seed. The hands of Saturn are said to be bound by Jupiter, because, as I have said, time now produces from matter nothing new. But the warmth of seeds restores all things according to their kinds. <clears throat> and no birth of Rhea, that is, no increase of flowing matter, ascends further and therefore they call that first division of the elements the mutilation of saturn because he cannot any more produce the world or a world <clears throat> and of now just so you know the allegories came after the disgusting things they actually did happen people venerated them and then the when the base things were known to be what they are, the allegories came to kind of put lipstick on the pig. It says, and of Venus, they give forth an allegory to this effect. When they say the sea was put under the air, and when the brightness of the sky shone more pleasantly, being reflected from the waters, the loveliness of things which appeared fairer from the waters was called Venus. And she, it, being united with the air, as with her, its own brother, so as to produce beauty, which might be the object of desire, is said to have given birth to Cupid. In this way, therefore, and that is the part of that son, daughter, that father, mother daughter that father mother son worship part of the trinity from babylon that was part of the perversion that they picked up in this area for the greeks and romans and that's pretty much the amalgamation going on they had different mystery religions throughout the world but it was all based on the same error and it was just adopted and amalgamated and conformed to as they were uniting themselves under different tyrannies First with Babylon, then the Medo-Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire, and then, of course, the Roman Empire, which we're still under the thumb of today. All right, so it says, so as to produce beauty, which might be the object of desire, is said to have given birth to Cupid. In this way, therefore, as we have said, they teach that Kronos, who is Saturn, is allegorically time. Rhea is matter. Hades, that is Orcus, is the depth of the infernal regions. Neptune is water. Jupiter is air, that is the element of heat. Venus is the loveliness of things. Cupid is desire, which is in all things, and by which posterity is propagated or even the reason of things, which gives delight when wisely looked into. Hera, that is Juno, 
and Hara, Hera, is literally the gazer. And that had to do with a title or a, a name for Hua or Eve, who gazed upon the fruit of the tree that was forbidden and saw that it was goodly. This is, is said to be that middle air that descends from heaven to earth to Diana, whom they call or Proserpine. Sorry, I'm not saying that right. Proserpine. They hand over the air below. They say that Apollyon is the sun himself, which goes round the heaven, that Mercury is speech, by which a reason is rendered for everything, that Mars is unrestrained fire, which consumes all things. But not to delay you by enumerating everything, those whom or those who have the more abstruse intelligence. Concerning such things, think that they give fair and just reasons by applying this sort of allegory to every one of their objects of worship. And when Nisita had thus spoken, Aquila said, Whoever he was that was the author and inventor of these things, he seems to me to have been very rebellious since he covered over those things that seemed to be pleasant and seemly, and made the ritual of his superstition to consist in base and shameful observances, since those things that are written according to the latter are manifestly unseemly and base, and the whole observance of their religion consists in these, that by such crimes and impieties they may teach men to imitate their mighty one whom they worship. For in these allegories, what profit can there be to them? For although they are framed so as to be decent, yet no use is derived from them for worship, nor for amendment of morals. Whence it is the more evident that prudent men, when they saw that the common superstition was so dishonorable, so base, and yet they had not learned any way of correcting it, or any knowledge, endeavored with what arguments and interpretations they could to veil unseemly things under seemly speech, and not, as they say, to conceal seemly reasons under unseemly fables. For if this was the case, surely their statues and their pictures would never be made, depicting their vices and crimes. The swan which committed adultery with Leda would not be represented, nor that bull that committed adultery with Europa, nor would they turn into a thousand monstrous shapes him whom they think better than all, and assuredly, if the great and wise men who are amongst them knew that all this is fiction and not truth, they would or would not they change or sorry, would not they charge with rebellion and blasphemy those who should exhibit a picture or carve an image of this sort to the injury of the Elohim or the mighty ones, right? In short, let them present a king of their own time in the form of an ox or a goose or an ant or a vulture, and let them write the name of their king or melech upon it, and set up such a statue or figure in a public place. And they will soon be made to feel the wrong of their deed and the greatness of its punishment. <clears throat> But since those things rather are true, that the public baseness testifies, and concealments have been sought and fabricated by prudent men, to excuse them by seemly speeches. Therefore, are they not only prohibited, but even in the very mysteries figures are produced of Saturn devouring his sons, and of the boy hidden by the symbols and drums of the Corybantes, 
and I don't want to get too far into that because this is already an unpleasant topic, but you can see the things that their mighty ones do, the same things that are attributed to these false Elohim are what the what the worshipers of the adversary follow because they, they do like the one they worship. So it says, Corbantes, with respect to the mutilation of Saturn, what better proof of its truth could there be than that even his worshipers are mutilated by a like miserable fate in honor of their mighty one? Since then, these things are manifestly seen. Who will not be found, or who will be found, rather, of so little sense, yea, of such stolidity, that he does not perceive that those things are true concerning the unfortunate mighty ones, which their more unfortunate worshipers attest by the wounding and mutilation of their bodies. Writings of the Poets. Right? But if, as they say, and just to tie that in with Scripture too, you had the priests of Baal, if you remember, they would cut themselves and do things when they're in the midst of their worship, trying to get their magical spells to be enacted right they would do incantations for cheap tricks from demons and that's all pagan it's all paganism is the priests were magicians just like in egypt and they did things to get power just like when you're obedient to our creator you are given his ruach and you have power from him, the ability to do things, to, to have um, what you say happen, your prayers heard, to heal others and do things that he enjoined. And that's all through history. In the same way, the adversary has those who serve him and do the things that he approves of. And they're given demons to do cheap parlor tricks to, to in, in contrast to the gifts of the Ruach is the point but none of them are for the benefit of men. He says, but if, as they say, these things so credibly and obediently done are dispensed by so discreditable and disobedient a ritual, assuredly he is evil, whoever either gave forth these things at first or persists in fulfilling them, now that they have sadly been given forth. And what will we say of the scrolls of the poets? Ought not they, if they have debased the honorable and obedient deeds of the mighty ones with base fables, to be forthwith cast away and thrown into the fire, that they may not persuade the still tender age of boys that Jupiter himself, the chief of, them, of the mighty ones, was a parasite towards his parents, incestuous towards his sisters and his daughters, and even impure towards boys. The Venus and Mars were adulterers, and all those things that have been spoken of above. What do you think of this matter, my master Kepha? And he gives how all is for the best. Even today, everything that happens is for the tov or the benefit of those who love Elohim. Right? Then he answered, Be sure, beloved Aquila, that all things are done by the Tob providence of Elohim, that the cause that was to be contrary to truth should not only be infirm and weak, but also base. For if the assertion of error had been stronger and more truth-like, anyone who had been deceived by it not easily or would not easily return to the path of truth but even now when so many immoral and dishonorable things are related concerning the mighty ones of the nations scarce anyone forsakes the base error and that's the problem if you well you might not be familiar but in the time of yahushua bringing the children into the land the son of Zerah, Achan, one of the tribe of Yahuda, had taken what was under the ban, and it was not to be taken. 
and he hid it in his tent, buried it under some stuff. And then the children started falling in battle and not overcoming their enemies. Yahushua and the elders tore their garments and inquired of Yahuwah mourning before him. And he told Yahushua, get up. What are you even mourning before me for? You know, stand up. Someone took what was under the ban and you're cursed. You can't. I'm not going to be with you. You're not going to stand before your enemies. This is what you have to do. And then he let them know, hey, someone took what was under the ban. Tomorrow we're going to call lots and figure it out. And then they waited. I didn't. I never really got why it wasn't done immediately, but Yahuwah gave whoever was responsible, Aiken in this, in this instance, an opportunity to repent, but they chose not to. So the next day, lots are cast. It comes to the tribe of Yahuda, comes to the, the sons of Zerah, comes to the house of Aiken's family, and then him, right? And he confesses, acknowledges it, and then he and his entire family, all his possessions are taken out, stoned, and buried. And then they were able to be successful over their enemies because they did not take part of the error. They were not cursed because of it. But other examples is Shaul, the first king, all right? When he was told to take out somebody and fight them and wipe them out, he pardoned the king and kept him alive. And he let the goods be taken as plunder for the people. And because he chose not to listen, he was rebuked for it. And when he argued after being corrected, he was cut off from, he, he wasn't allowed to continue being the sovereign because he chose not to repent. So these things are very, uh, everyone that agreed with them was guilty of it is the problem. And that's not something that you want to be a part of. That's why it clearly tells us in the epistles to put away the wicked from among you. All right. And for another example of not to associate in business dealings with those that are reprobate at the time, you have Yahushaphat and Ahaz, right? The, the, the king of Yisrael, who was husband to Jezebel, or what they call Jezebel. He was in league. Yahushaphat was in league with him. And then his son with the ships of, uh, trying to do shipping to Tarshish, which is Spain. And because he was in league with his enemy, or because Yahushaphat, who was serving Yahuwah, was in league with um, Ahaz, who was not, he was told that his ships would be ruined, his business was going to be destroyed, but he was preserved because he served Yahuwah. So it's something that we ought to be mindful of not to do, not to associate in hunt in business or to do things with those that are not not people were ignorant of and that's another thing too like helping strangers or doing kind deeds to those that you don't know you, you don't need to go in and say are you a believer do you call on his name this that and the other you help those that are in need although you prefer believers that's the injunction but if someone is openly a reprobate if they're blaspheming their creator and going out murdering others with what they're doing and saying things that are evil You'd want to try to correct that, but you don't want anything to do with it. You don't associate. You, I mean, you can give somebody in their need. I wouldn't recommend um, joining in any kind of business or doing anything with that other than getting away. One more example of that you can have is extra scriptural, but Yahukanon, the emissary, when he had a run-in with Serinthus, who was the leader of the Nicolaitans at the time. He found out he had went into the same building with him. He up and left and told everyone, we got to get out in case this place falls on him immediately. And he wanted to do nothing with that man or not even be around him. That's the kind of mentality we should have. Just one moment. Okay, thank you. But here, Kef is explaining that the reason why it's so disgusting and base and so deplorable is because it's not the truth. And there's no, our maker didn't want to give any anything worthy of attention to that side to be something that, oh, well, there might have been something worth being deceived for. 
It's absolutely disgusting. There is no redeeming features to it. And that was the whole point. So he says, for if the assertion of error had been stronger and more truth-like, anyone who had been deceived by it would not easily return to the path of truth. If even now, when so many immoral and dishonorable things are related concerning the mighty ones of the nations, scarce anyone forsakes the base error. How much more if there had been in it anything seemly and truth-like? For the mind is with difficulty transferred from those things with which it has been imbued in early youth. And on this account, as I said, it has been affected by Yahuwah that the substance of error should be both weak and base. But all other things also Yahuwah dispenses fitly and advantageously. Although the method of Elohim's dispensation, as good and the best possible, is not clear to us who are ignorant of the causes of things. When Kepha had thus said, I, Clement, asked Nisita that he would explain to us for the sake of instruction some things concerning the allegories of the nations which he had carefully studied. For, said I, it is useful that, we, that when we dispute with the nations, we should not be unacquainted with these things. Then said Nisita, If my master Kepha permits me, I can do as you ask me. Then said Kepha, Today I have given you leave to speak in opposition to the nations, as you know. And Nasita said, Tell me then, Clement, what you would have me speak about. And I said to him, Inform us how the nations represent matters concerning the supper of the mighty ones, which they had at the marriage of Peleus and Thetis. What do they make of the shepherd Paris, and what of less Juno, Minerva, and Venus, between whom he acted as judge? What of Mercury, and what of the apple, and the other things that follow in order? And these are just different stories and things that they have of Greek mythology. I don't, I'm not entirely familiar with all of them. So just one moment here. All right, so it's explanation of mythology. Then Nasita, the affair of the supper of the mighty ones stands in this wise. They say that the banquet is the world, that the order of the mighty ones sitting at table is the position of the Shamaim or heavenly bodies. Those whom Hisad calls the first children of heaven and earth of whom six were males and six females, they refer to the number of the 12 signs. And just so you know, not directly related, but I use heavenly here because it's talking about Greek mythology. When we're talking about the literal Shemaim, I use Shemaim because that's the word in scripture and it has a meaning. Heaven has a meaning too, but that meaning is... That word came to us because the Hebrew was changed over time. It lost some of the words and it adopted others. And that's one of them that we adopted in English that we dropped Shemaim from. So just getting back to the original, when we're talking about things that relate to the truth. However, if you ever want to see that this is something that's done throughout scripture, if you look at the Greek manuscripts of the Renewed Covenant writings before the Textus Receptus, what they had in, in it was called Nomnia Sacra, which were placeholders, sacred names in Latin, but they were placeholders that were used for certain words like Elohim, Yahuwah, Yahushua, man, as in the son of Adam, right? David, as in Dawid. Um, Mashiach, Ruach, 
and a few other words, right? But they would interchange that whenever it was talking about our creator, they would use the placeholders for Elohim or his name. When it was talking about false mighty ones of the nations, it would use theos and the just the regular Greek word because it had no inherent meaning. It wasn't necessary to be honorable to them or to be distinct or set apart. But when you're speaking of Yahuwah, his words, his names are distinct. It's why I use Ruach or Ruach when I'm talking about the spirit of our creator. But I can use spirit or spirits when talking about the others. Because that's what I see in the scriptures, in the placeholders that were in the original Greek manuscripts from the 3rd century to the 14th century or so. And the reason why they use the placeholders instead of just having the, the Hebrew names written in anymore, which was what they originally did, was because the Hebrew language was banned by Rome and they were destroying all those writings. But back on track here, it says, which go around all the world. They say that the dishes of the banquet are the reasons and causes of things, sweet and desirable, which in the shape of inferences from the positions of the signs and the courses of the stars, explain how the world is ruled and governed. They say, or yet they say these things exist after a free manner of a banquet, inasmuch as the mind of everyone has the option whether he will taste aught of this knowledge or of this sort of knowledge, or whether he will refrain. And as in a banquet, no one is compelled, but everyone is at liberty to eat, so also the manner of philosophizing depends upon the choice of the will. They say that discord is the lust of the flesh, which rises up against the purpose of the mind and hinders the desire of philosophizing. And therefore they say that the time was in which the marriage it was celebrated. Thus they make Peleus and the nymph Thetis to be the dry and the moist element by the admixture of which the substance of bodies is composed. They hold that mercury is speech, by which instruction is conveyed to the mind, that Juno is chastity, Minerva courage, Venus lust, Paris the comprehension. And therefore they say, or say they, there is in a man a barbarous and uncultivated comprehension, an ignorant of right judgment. He will despise chastity and courage, and will give the prize which is the apple to lust, and thereby ruin and destruction will come not only upon himself, but also upon his countrymen and the whole race. These things, therefore, it is in their power to compose from whatever matter they please, yet they can be adapted to every man. Because if anyone has a pastoral and rustic and uncultivated comprehension and does not desire to be instructed, when the heat of his body will make suggestions concerning the pleasure of lust, straightway he despises the virtues of studies and the blessings of knowledge, or the birak oath of knowledge, and turns his mind to bodily pleasures. And hence it is that implacable wars arise, cities are destroyed and countries fall, even as Paris by the abduction of Helen, armed the Greeks and the barbarians to their mutual destruction. Now right here he's talking about the cause of the, the, the siege of Troy or the Trojan War. But if you read the ancient history of Caldonia, the Greek version is perverted. The Trojans kept what they called the laws of the altar. They were Hebrews that kept the, the words of Hanok and the, the testaments of the 12 patriarchs, what Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov gave to his children to do, and the 12, that's what they did. 
and they kept the circumcision and they they sacrificed to Yahuwah only. So anyone that wanted to marry their daughters, they would refuse unless they became circumcised and kept the laws of the altar for seven years, proving that they would, you know, join their people. And then they would let their daughters marry them. Helen was a beautiful daughter of the, the Trojans who a Greek king wanted to marry, but they refused him. So he laid siege against them because he did not want to become circumcised. And that's what that was really about. But in the Greek version of it, it's you got a 180 flip of the story and it's perverted. So um, <clears throat> that's also a common theme if you pay attention. Now you can see right after he makes that comment, this is what Kepha says about that. And I think it's very telling, although I don't know how familiar he is with the Caledonians. But then Kepha, commending his statement, said, Ingenious men, as I perceive, take many counterfeits looking much like truth from the things that they read, meaning the Iliad and the Odyssey, right? And therefore, great care is to be taken that when the law of Elohim is read, it be not read according to the comprehension of our own mind. For there are many sayings in the set of part scriptures that can be drawn to the sense that everyone has preconceived for himself. And the example of that is what Simon the Magician was doing earlier in the book and what Irenaeus condemns in his against heresies um and also what we call soundbite theology where you just take a verse here and a verse there and you put it together and you come up with your own opinions about what it means all right and this ought not to be done for you ought not to seek a foreign and extraneous sense which you have brought from without which you may confirm from the authority of the scriptures, but to take the sense of truth from the scriptures themselves. And therefore it behooves you to learn the meaning of the scriptures from him who keeps it according to the truth handed down to him from his fathers, so that he can authoritatively declare what he has rightly received. But when one has received an entire and firm rule of the truth from the scriptures, it will not be improper if he contribute to the establishment of true doctrine anything from common education and from liberal studies, which it may be he has attached himself to in his boyhood, yet so that when he has learned the truth, he renounce falsehood and pretense. And when he had said this, he looked to our father and said, You therefore, old man, if indeed you care for your inner being's safety, that when you desire to be separated from the body, it may, in consequence of what may be a short conversion, find ageless rest, ask whatever, or ask about whatever you please, and seek counsel, that you may be able to cast off any doubt that remains in you. For even to young men, the time of life is uncertain, but to old men, it is not even uncertain. For there is no doubt that there is but little time remaining to them. And therefore, both young and old ought to be very earnest about their conversion and repentance, and to be taken up with the adornment of their inner beings for the future, with the worthiest ornaments such as the halakha or path of truth, the favor of chastity, the splendor of righteousness, the fairness of obedience, and all other things with that it becomes a reasonable mind to be adorned. Then besides they should break off from unseemly and unbelieving companions and keep company with the trustworthy and frequent those assemblies in which subjects are handled relating to chastity, righteousness, and obedience. This is exactly what you see in the Apostolic Constitutions and what you can find even before then in the examples throughout the original covenant writings, separating from those that were in error 
separating from all the nations, having nothing to do with them, right? And you can see it also expounded on in Sirach ben Yahushua or Ecclesiasticus, where he tells you to go early to the door, get yourself to the door of a wise man, get knock on it early, and you, you listen to what he has to say, and you abstain and you get away from wicked people. He tells you who to listen to for advice and who not to. I mean, it's all throughout the scriptures you can find these things either practically applied in the story of how it's actually walked out or being taught in these forms as you can read. All right, it says to pray to Yahuwah always heartily and to ask of him those things that ought to be asked of Elohim, to give thanks to him, to repent truly of their past doings, in some measure also, if possible, by deeds of mercy towards the poor, to help their repentance. And that's another thing. You'll find it in Tobit or Toby Yahu, Ecclesiasticus, the Apostolic Constitutions, the books of the Maccabees. Uh, restitution to the poor helps forgiveness of sins. If you don't have the means to help immediately or make restitution for the one that you offended, you can give to the poor to do so. But coming empty-handed and just saying, I'm sorry, without having it cost you anything isn't, isn't asking forgiveness uh, so much as it's asking not to get punished for what you did wrong, right? You're not trying to make it right. You're just trying to not get in trouble for it. And if you recall, Yahushua Mashiach himself said, when you come to pray, when you come to the altar to give an offering and you remember that anyone or your brother has a problem with you, not that you have an issue with somebody, but if anyone has an issue with you, you set down the offering and then you go and you make it right. You restore that relationship first and then you come and make your offering to your, to your maker. So it's all about repentance and restoration first with men and then with him. But we can't seek his face and forgiveness if we're, if we're trampling on his image. It's not possible. For by these means, pardon will be more easily bestowed and mercy will be sooner shown to the merciful. But if he who comes to repentance is of more advanced age, he ought the more to give thanks to Elohim, because having received the knowledge of the truth, after all the violence of carnal lust has been broken, there awaits him no fight of contest, but which to or by which to repress the pleasures of the body rising against the mind. It remains, therefore, that he be exercised in the learning of the truth and in works of mercy that he may bring forth fruits worthy of repentance, and that he do not suppose that the proof of conversion is shown by length of time, but by strength of devotion and of purpose. For minds are wide open to Elohim, and he does not take count of times but of hearts, for he approves if any one on hearing the preaching of truth does not delay nor spend time in negligence, but immediately, and if I may say so, in the same moment, abhorring the past begins to desire things to come and burns with love of the Shemaim Malkuth, or the Malkuth Shemaim, the kingdom of the heavens, if you will. So let no one of you longer neither dissemble nor look backwards but willingly approach to the good news of the Malkuth of Yahuwah. Let not the poor man say, when I will become rich, I will be converted. Elohim does not ask money of you, but a merciful heart and a compliant mind. Nor let the rich man delay his conversion by reason of his worldly, or by reason of worldly care, while he thinks how he may dispose the abundance of his fruits nor say within himself, what will I do? Where will I bestow my fruits? Nor say to his inner being, you have much goods laid up for many years. Feast and rejoice, for it will be said to him, 
You fool, this night your inner being will be taken from time. And whose will those things be that you have provided? Therefore, let every age, every sex, and every condition haste to repentance, that they may obtain ageless life. Let the young be thankful that they put their necks under the yoke of discipline in the very violence of their desires. The old also are themselves praiseworthy, because they change for the fear of Elohim, the custom of a long time, in that they have been sadly occupied. Let no one therefore put off, let no one delay, for what occasion is there for delaying to do well? Or are you afraid, lest when you have done well, you do not find the reward as you supposed? And what loss will you sustain if you do well without reward? Would not conscience alone be sufficient in this? But if you find as you anticipate, will you not receive great things for small and ageless for temporal? But I say this for the sake of the unbelieving. For the things that we preach are as we preach them because they cannot be otherwise, since they have been promised by the word of the foreteller. But if anyone desires to learn exactly the truth of our preaching, let him come to hear. Let him ascertain what the true foreteller Yahushua is, and then at length all doubtfulness will cease to him unless with obstinate mind he resists those things that he finds to be true. For there are some whose only object it is to gain the victory in any way whatever, and who seek praise for this rather than their deliverance. These ought not to have a single word addressed to them, lest both the noble word suffer injury and condemn to ageless death him who is guilty of the wrong done to it. For what is there in respect of which anyone ought to oppose our preaching, or in respect of which the word of our preaching is found to be contrary to the belief of what is true and honorable? It says that Yahuwah the Father, the creator of all, is to be honored as also his Son, who alone knows him and his will and who alone is to be believed concerning all things that he has enjoined. Now, the one, the fact that he alone knows his will, it says that no man, no one has seen the Father, but the Son alone. He, it says that throughout the Renewed Covenant writings, and you can go all the way to the book of Hanok, where Hanok himself is changed into a messenger in the Ruach and brought before the presence of the Father, he's able to perceive that the garments of the Father are brighter than the Son, but he cannot look upon him, and none, none of the messengers can either. Right? It's only the Son who alone knows him in his will. And that's why it says in the epistles with Shaul that the Father dwells in unapproachable light, who no one can see nor is able to see, because he's perceived with the mind. But it says, um, the creator of all is to be honored as also his son, who alone knows him and his will, and who alone is to be believed concerning all things that he has enjoined. For he alone is the Torah and the Torah giver. So he's the word that was made flesh, but he's also the one who gave the Torah. Our Mashiach is the one who spoke on Mount Sinai, with an audible voice giving the commandments to men for them to keep. He's the one that made covenant with men and ratified it with his own blood. And that's why he had to die. But most people don't quite get that connection. But it says, he alone is the Torah and the Torah giver and the righteous judge whose law decrees that Yahuwah, who is Elohim of all, is to be honored by a sober, chaste 
righteous and merciful life, and that all expectation or hope is to be placed in him alone. And I think that'd be an excellent place to stop for today with uh, the wonderful words of Kepha after some of that unpleasantness that we had to go through. But Ob willing, you can see that these things were written to point out the disgusting things that they were doing and to get men not to do or continue agreeing with them. So thank you for your time and Yahuwah Yahushua be with you all. You have a wonderful Shabbat and week ahead.